Israel. Today, its very existence is a miracle. The Bible tells us it is the inheritance of God's chosen people, the Jews. But what does that mean for the people of the New Testament? The followers of Jesus. Does Israel have a right to exist? And if so, why should we care? The nation of Israel can trace its roots back to the patriarch Abraham. A man chosen by God to be the father of many nations, whose children would be like the stars of the sky. Israel, a journey through time, past, present, and prophetic. What the prophet said about Israel. The story begins here, in this desert landscape, which in the distant past was a fertile plain. It was to this place that Abraham and his nephew Lot came with their families, their flocks. And they settled here between the mountains of Jordan on the east and the hills of Israel on the west. It was a good land, a land flowing with milk and honey. But who was Abraham? And why is he considered the father of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam? Abraham first appears as Abram in Genesis 11:26. He was born in Ur of the Chaldeans, which is now located in modern-day Iraq. The story of Abraham is an interesting story. It's a story about a family and a person who started at the heart of civilization of that time in Mesopotamia, which is today Iraq and Syria, uh, in between the two huge rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris. Very fertile area, a uh, real center of civilization, power, urbanism. And uh, his family, his father, took him and the rest of the family from south there to the place of Ur, moving to Haran. The Bible tells us that Abram, his wife Sarai, and his father Terah set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. Canaan means lowland. It was also the name given to one of Noah's grandsons, whose descendants settled on this lowland plain along the coast of the Great Sea. Better known today as the Mediterranean Sea. The various branches of this family became known as the Canaanites. The book of Genesis tells us in chapter 10 that the Canaanites lived in the land between Sidon and and Gaza. Today, 4,000 years later, these places still exist. The coastal plain was fertile and ideal for growing crops and fruit. It also had strategic importance as a land bridge between three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. Canaan was the place where the armies of Egypt often clashed with empires of the East, among them the Babylonians and Persians, each empire trying to achieve military and commercial advantage over the other. 
whoever controlled this narrow corridor between the mountains and the Great Sea also controlled many of the trade routes between East and West. And so the narrow strip of the Holy Land is the only place that people could go through uh, to come from one center of civilization to another one. And hence this area become very much involved in all what happened in the ancient world. In Roman times, this coastal plain was known as the Via Maris, the way of the sea. No empire with dreams of expansion could ignore the importance of Canaan or Israel as it was later called. Abraham was to be the father of many nations, but God called him to be the father of one nation in particular, Israel. And so God entered into a covenant relationship with Abraham. From then on, his male descendants would be circumcised as a sign of the covenant from Genesis 17 verse 10. In Genesis 17 verse 8, God promised Abraham it would be theirs as an everlasting possession. He would also bless those who blessed them and curse those who cursed them. While Abraham and his nephew Lot prospered on the fertile plains of Canaan, they also ran the risk of being contaminated by Canaanite practices which God looked upon as sinful abominations. Most people have heard the words Sodom and Gomorrah, but many people do not know what the words mean. They're names of cities found in the Bible in the Old Testament. There were cities that were here at one time in the distant past. Five major cities of the plain, just south of the Salt Sea, or today it's known as the Dead Sea. There were thriving cities here in the land of Israel. But they were full of wickedness. And they were an abomination in the sight of God. The people of the land of Canaan worshipped Baal and Dagon among other false gods. Their practices of worship were sadistic rituals of unspeakable acts, including the sacrifice of children. The Lord spoke to Abraham and told him that this is the reason he was giving the land of Canaan to Abraham's descendants. In all the land of Canaan, two cities stood out among the rest as being the most evil and wicked. Sodom and Gomorrah. In Genesis 18, the Lord tells Abraham that the outcry is too great and sends two angels to destroy the cities. And he sent them to warn Abram and Lot of the destruction that was to come. Look at this landscape today. At one time, a fertile plain with fresh water running, flocks, herds grazing here, and then the judgment of God fell. The Bible says that fire and brimstone rained down from heaven on what had been a fertile plain. At one time, people lived here. They thrived here. But in their lifestyle, they disobeyed God. He saw the wickedness of these cities. He judged them, and they are no more. What was a fertile landscape, a place of laughter, has become instead a barren wilderness. Sodom, Gomorrah, synonyms for wickedness and the judgment of a righteous God. But the story of Israel continued because God had promised blessings to Abram and his descendants and they became Israel. God had promised Abraham that his descendants would be as uncountable as the stars in the sky. However, Abraham and his wife Sarah were getting old and impatient. Sarah decided to give her Egyptian maidservant Hagar to Abraham and Hagar bore him a son, Ishmael. Their impatience would later come back to haunt them and is the source of conflict in Israel today. At the age of 100, 
Abraham finally sees the fulfillment of God's promise when Sarah gives birth to Isaac. Coming to the uh, Holy Land, Abraham passed through the uh, uh, area of the mountain all the way to Beersheba. Then he was told to take uh, his only son, uh, Isaac, to Mount Moriah. And the Bible doesn't say more than uh, the mountains of Moriah are three days' walk from his place in Beersheba. Uh, the tradition, even the Book of Psalms, uh, point uh, the place where the temple was later built, the Temple Mount, as Mount Moriah. And the connection is very clear. God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son, Isaac. Child sacrifice was a fairly common practice among the Canaanites. Abraham had witnessed the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and being close to God, must have known how much the Lord hated these pagan rituals. One can only imagine what Abraham must have been thinking as he prepared to sacrifice the son that God had promised him. As parents, we love our children. It's hard then for us to comprehend the test that God gave Abraham in the distant past. God said to Abraham, Go to a mountain that I will show you. The Bible tells us they were the mountains of Moriah. Tradition says the mountain behind us, the golden dome of the Mosque of Omar, where at one time the Temple of Solomon stood, sacred ground to Muslims and to Jews. And God said to Abraham, take your only son, Isaac, to this mountain. And then God gave Abraham a test. He said, I want you to sacrifice Isaac to me. Can you imagine? So the altar was prepared, wood, for burning the sacrifice. And Isaac, Abraham's son, said, But where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And as Abraham prepared to plunge his knife into his son in obedience to the commandment of God, an angel spoke to him and said, Do not slay your son. And in a thicket, a ram caught by its horns, it would be the sacrifice. I think of those words of Isaac, Abraham's son, in so many words, but Father, where is the lamb? And then I cast my mind down through the centuries to another time when God gave another lamb. John the Baptist, seeing him that day come to the river Jordan, said of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. In Abraham's case, God provided a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. But in his own case, there was no substitute. He gave his only begotten Son. But whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus, the Lamb of God. While two major faiths now lay claim to the sacred ground of what is known as the Temple Mount, it is important to realize that one is relatively new compared to the other. God called Abraham to be the father of the Jews some 4,000 years ago, around 2000 B.C. Yet Islam emerged less than 1400 years ago, following the birth and influence of a man named Muhammad. Yet both claim Abraham as their ancestral father, the Jews through Abraham's son Isaac by his wife Sarah, the Muslims through Abraham's son Ishmael by Sarah's Egyptian servant Hagar. The effects of this dysfunctional family continue to be felt today. The Bible teaches that God's covenant promises to Abraham were to be extended down through Isaac and his son Jacob. The names of Jacob's twelve sons became the titles given to the twelve tribes of Israel, each tribe being comprised of the descendants of each of Jacob's sons and their families. In time they would be known as the chosen people and heirs of God's covenant promise to Abraham.
He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers His covenant forever. The word He commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant He made with Abraham. The oath He swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree. To Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion you will inherit. I'm always amazed when I'm in Israel, wherever I walk, I'm surrounded by the voices of history. Every meter of ground has some historic significance. Here, I'm standing on a place where in the 6th to 8th centuries before Christ, the kings of Judea had their palaces. We're overlooking the modern and ancient road from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. Jerusalem that way with its Temple Mount and Bethlehem to the south. It was along this road that Jacob traveled. He was the grandson of Abraham. He and his wife Rachel. And as they approached Ephrat or Bethlehem as it is known today, she gave birth to her second son. His name was Benjamin. She had wanted to call him Benoni, which meant the son of my sorrow. She was dying even as she gave birth, but Jacob said, no, we'll call him Benjamin, which means the son of my right hand. So Rachel died on the road to Bethlehem, this road behind me, just a little ways to the south. And Jacob placed up a pillar over her grave, and the scripture says in Genesis 35 that the pillar is there to this very day. In fact, it is there to this day in the 21st century. One more milestone in the journey of the people of Israel. Joseph, the favorite son of Jacob. His story has fascinated the world for thousands of years. The son of Israel betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, he is taken to Egypt where he eventually rises from the depths of prison to become ruler under Pharaoh. Famine in the land of Canaan eventually forces Jacob and his sons to move to Egypt where Joseph can take care of them. The Bible then enters a period of silence for 400 years. Exodus wakens to find the Israelites, the descendants of Jacob, now forced into slavery by a ruler in Egypt who did not know the history of Joseph and the Israelites. The first chapter of the book of Exodus ends with the horrific order of Pharaoh to throw every baby boy into the river Nile. On the banks of the Nile, a Hebrew woman places her son in a papyrus basket in a desperate attempt to spare his life. Moses is found by the Pharaoh's daughter and taken to be raised as her own. Moses was born as a Hebrew, but raised as a prince of Egypt. As God had been with Joseph some 400 years earlier, now he would be with Moses. Then Pharaoh's daughter went to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered, and the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. Raised as a prince of Egypt's royal household, Moses learned the ways of the Egyptians, but he remained a Hebrew at heart. One fateful day, he found an Egyptian mistreating a Hebrew slave. Moses intervened and in an impulsive act, killed the Egyptian. Fleeing for his life, Moses spends 40 years in Midian, where he married his wife Zipporah, and he would learn the ways of a desert shepherd and nomad. But he would do so under the watchful eye of the God of all creation, and of Israel. When time had passed, God acted again. 
A bush burned in the wilderness, but surprisingly it was not destroyed by the flames. Moses was curious about this strange phenomenon and turned aside to see it. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. God had heard the cries of his chosen ones as they labored in the slime pits of Egypt. And Moses' appointed time had come for them to be delivered out of bondage. Moses would be the instrument of that deliverance, but not before the ten plagues had humbled Pharaoh's heart and forced him to respond to Moses' demand. Thus says the Lord of Israel, Let my people go. The tenth and final plague was the most costly of all for the Egyptians, for it claimed the firstborn of all living things, including the firstborn of Pharaoh. Only those Hebrews who obediently applied lamb's blood to the doorways of their homes escaped the horrors of that dark night when death stalked the streets of Egypt. From that night on, it would be called the Passover. And each year as Israel remembered their exodus from Egypt, children would ask, why is this night so special? Parents would answer by reciting the story of the miraculous deliverance from bondage in Egypt, and one generation would tell another. They would tell of nights and days of God's miracles and provision. But if they were to tell the whole story, they would also speak of Israel's disobedience and rebellion, and of the forty lost years of wilderness wandering. We've called this series, Israel, A Journey Through Time. And time was what it took for the children of Israel to come from Egypt to this, the Holy Land. And surely they passed through this way, a place that is called the Wilderness of Zin. A river runs through this valley and this would have provided nourishment for the thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that were part of that generation of Israel that came here initially to settle the land more than 3,000 years ago. And Israel lives on here in the desert and elsewhere along this Mediterranean coast. People of God, people in covenant with their God, a peculiar people God called a nation. Moses had led the people of Israel out of Egypt and into the desert. Here they would have to trust God. It wasn't long before the Israelites began to complain, yet each time Moses cried out to the Lord, and each time the Lord responded with a miracle. During this time in the desert, God gave Moses and the people of Israel the Ten Commandments and had them build the Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle. I feel like I've just stepped back into history more than 3,000 years back in time into the tabernacle of Moses and its linen enclosure here deep in the desert in the wilderness of Paran. When God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, He said to them, Build me a tabernacle that I may dwell among you. And here in this sacred setting, the tabernacle of Moses, deep in the desert, around the mountains of the wilderness. God gave specific instructions recorded in the book of Exodus of the linen enclosure that should surround the tabernacle with the tribes all around in their specific positions relative to the tabernacle and then the coverings of badger skins, goat hair and then the high priest once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, he alone entering 
the most holy place, sprinkling blood before the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, making atonement for the sins of the children of Israel, keeping the relationship with God righteous through the sacrifice of animals as God required. Here Israel commune with her God and here the God of Israel was at the very center of his people as they moved from place to place through the wilderness moving from Egypt the place of bondage toward the promised land the place flowing with milk and honey Moses would live long enough to see the promised land but he would never enter it. The conquest of Canaan would fall to Joshua, Moses' chosen successor. It would be under his leadership that the army of Israel would subdue the Canaanite tribes and claim the land as their God-given inheritance. God spoke to Moses. He told him he'd been chosen to lead the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt to a promised land that he would show them. They left Egypt and they crossed the wilderness of Sinai. They came eventually after days to the wilderness of Paran. This is the wilderness of Paran. They camped on the border of what was the land of Canaan. And from there, Moses sent 12 spies, a leader from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, 12 chosen men who would go through the length and breadth of the land of Canaan and spy it out and bring back a report. So the men went north through the wilderness of Zin. They went east toward Hebron and the valley of Eshkol. Eshkol means cluster and they brought back the grapes on a cluster on a stave between two men. They said truly it is as the Lord has said. Joshua and Caleb, two of those leaders, were ready to go in and possess the land. They were men of great faith. But the other ten spies brought a negative report. They said, yes, the land is as God has said, but there are giants in the land and there are fortified cities. We'll not be able to overcome them. We are in their sight as grasshoppers. They are giants compared to who we are. It's amazing, isn't it, that these men who had seen God open the waters of the Red Sea provide manna from heaven, bread of heaven to feed this. Imagine, how could a multitude the size of the, the multitude that left Egypt be sustained in this barren wilderness place? But God, God sustained them by providing miracles, water that bubbled up from the desert floor, bread that fell from heaven, quail, little birds that blew in from the Mediterranean Sea, and God kept his word and fed them. But time after time, the people murmured and questioned God. They came to the border of what became Israel. And because they rebelled against God, they were turned back into the desert for more than 40 years. And God kept them there until that first generation, all those aged 20 and older, had died in the wilderness. And then he brought the new generation into the land of Israel. After 40 years of wandering in the desert, the Israelites were finally ready to take the Promised Land. Under the leadership of Joshua, Jericho was the first to fall. The 12 tribes of Israel eventually took the land God promised and divided it among the tribes. In time, kings would be appointed to rule the people, but not before there was a prolonged interlude when judges held sway. Violent times when sin and rebellion were all too prevalent among Jacob's descendants, and when they eagerly embraced the idolatrous ways of the Canaanites. Even so, God found those who would speak and act for him. Men like Gideon, Samson, and women like Deborah. It is toward the end of this dark period in the unfolding drama of Israel that a young Gentile woman from Moab named Ruth enters the history of God's chosen people.
having married the son of a widow from Bethlehem named Naomi, Ruth suddenly finds herself widowed as well. It is then that she makes the momentous decision to leave Moab and return with Naomi to Bethlehem. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Ruth could not have known then that by her decision to honor Naomi and to be a blessing to Israel, she would be among the first to reap God's promise to Abraham. Ruth's blessing came in the form of remarriage to a relative of Naomi, a wealthy landowner in Bethlehem named Boaz. Their union would produce a grandson named David, who would become God's chosen king of Israel. More importantly, it would be from among Ruth and Boaz's descendants that the long-awaited Messiah would arise, the one the prophet said was to come. He too would be from Bethlehem, but his coming, his words, and his influence would ultimately change the world. His name was Jesus, the Jew who divided history. In the distance, the mountains of Moab, which is the setting for the story of Naomi and Ruth, told in the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. Below those mountains, the Salt Sea, or the Dead Sea, as people call it today. But just below me here, springs of fresh water, a new phenomenon that has occurred in recent years, but it is really the fulfillment of a prophecy that Isaiah gave in the distant past. It's recorded in Isaiah, 35. The prophet writes, The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice, and blossom as the rose. For water shall burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, in the habitation of jackals where each lay, meaning where jackals once lay by the shores of a dead sea. Now there shall be grass with reeds and rushes, birds splashing in the waters, finding nourishment in the wilderness, where you will not find them in the Dead Sea, for nothing can live in the Dead Sea. But here, by these fresh water pools, creation sings. Creation is alive in God's prophetic fulfillment of what the prophets have said, in the future restoration of Zion, of Israel, future glory, that God said would surely, surely come. The period of the judges was ending just as the prophets began to appear again in Israel. And while an unnamed prophet had spoken to Israel during the period of the judges, Samuel was the first named among the major prophets to appear. It was as God's prophet that Samuel anointed the first kings of Israel, beginning with Saul. But this did not occur until near the end of Samuel's life, and not before he had appointed his sons to rule as judges in Israel. But Samuel's sons were corrupt in their ways. They were unacceptable to the people who instead demanded their own king. God viewed this demand as a rejection of his own sovereign rule. Yet, he granted their wish anyway, coupled with a warning uttered on the lips of Samuel. The people of Israel would live to regret their persistent pleas for a king to rule over them. And so it was that Saul, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, became Israel's first king. And, as God had solemnly warned, Israel lived to regret Saul's rule, which ended in bitterness, marked by defeat at the hands of the Philistines, and the untimely deaths of his three sons in a battle with the Philistines on the slopes of Mount Gilboa. It was here too that Saul's life came to a dramatic end, when, seriously wounded by the arrows of his enemies, he chose to fall on his own sword. In truth, God had already rejected Saul's kingship long before this dark day 
for he had not always been obedient to the commands of God. As a result, God took the kingdom from him, promising to give it to another, a king of God's own choosing. David, son of Jesse, great-grandson of Ruth and Boaz, would be the new king of Israel. David, who earlier had been Saul's champion in the contest with the Philistine giant Goliath, was popular with the people of Israel, which only enraged Saul and fueled the fires of his jealousy. More than once he tried to kill David, who was forced to flee for his life to the wilderness. Throughout the long and turbulent history of Israel, men found the wilderness of Judea a place to hide place of refuge. When they were running from civilization, they would come here. David came here when he was running away from King Saul, from his anger. Elijah the prophet found refuge in the caves in the wilderness of Judea. Men could run from other men. They could find refuge here, enough water to drink, enough food to sustain them. But David also found that he could not run from God. While he could escape the wrath of men, God always knew where he was. And he said, David said, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Wherever I go, you are there. Even here, in the wilderness of Judea, God found David. The people of Israel still look upon the reign of David as Israel's high watermark. While David had character flaws and at times showed poor moral judgment, God nevertheless saw him as a man after his own heart. Because of David's leadership and popularity, Israel was united, established, and prosperous. King David had a great mission, and that is to take a group of tribes and make them a nation. And one of his steps was, let me have a place that would serve the uh, capital that I uh, won't emphasize the tribal structure. The other way around, it's like building, say, Washington, D.C., a place that did not belong to any of the tribes, and even was at the border between two of the tribes, Judah to the south and now uh, Benjamin to the north. So his first step was conquering a place and deciding, let me build here my capital, because that will serve the purpose of reuniting those tribes. Make them relate to the place as a uh, unified place and not belonging to any one chosen tribe. Now with Jerusalem as its capital, David proposed to build a house for God. However, because he had blood on his hands from so many conflicts, the responsibility for building the temple became the mandate of David's son, Solomon. A man God blessed with unparalleled wisdom, and whose fame spread far beyond the borders of Israel. If Israel had prospered under David, its wealth compounded under Solomon. But Solomon was not David, and in time, he too violated the will of God. I remember as a boy reading the story of King Solomon's mines, conjured up in my mind images of buried treasure. Now as a man I walk in the region of King Solomon's mines. Here slaves were brought from all over the ancient world, probably boys among them, forced to dig in the dirt, to dig tunnels into the earth, to extract more practical minerals like copper, minerals that would be used in Solomon's great kingdom even the Queen of Sheba heard of Solomon's fame, his wealth, his wisdom. And she came all the way from the continent of Africa to visit him here in the land of Israel. These pillars are known as Solomon's pillars. Tall sentinels that have been here for thousands of years. What stories they could tell of armies that marched through here, of nations that encamped here, of slaves who worked here, who spent their lives here among these canyons and tall mountains in the wilderness of Paran, deep in the deserts of Israel.
So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives, who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude, and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son, yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem which I have chosen. And God stirred up adversaries against Solomon, and from that time forward his kingdom knew no peace. Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel forty years. Then he rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father. And Rehoboam his son succeeded him as king. Rehoboam lacked his father's wisdom. Ignoring the advice of the older and wiser elders of Israel, he chose instead to listen to the foolish counsel of his peers, with the result that had been the United Kingdom under David and Solomon was now divided. From then on there would be two kingdoms, one consisting of ten tribes known as Israel who possessed the northern half of the country, and two tribes Judah and Benjamin, who remained in the south, in the vicinity of Jerusalem. Time passed, and in the 8th century BC, the northern kingdom was conquered by the Assyrians. While in 586 BC, the armies of Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar captured the southern kingdom consisting of Judah and Benjamin. In the process, the Babylonians also destroyed Jerusalem and the temple Solomon had built on Mount Moriah, better known today as the Temple Mount. This brought to an end Israel's most glorious days. I've had the privilege of coming to Israel many times through the years. But I'm always amazed of the natural beauty of this country. Small in size, but the contrasts are remarkable. One minute you can be in the desert and the next minute in the green hills of Galilee. One moment by the Dead Sea where no natural life forms exist. And then in the Sea of Galilee, which is teeming with fish. And on this day, along the shores of the Dead Sea, and just above the oasis of En Gedi, again, the natural landscape. It's as if God, every day, takes out his paintbrush and he paints a new scene of beauty in this land that he called his own. This is a desert place, but it was in biblical times a place of refuge. David found refuge here from the anger of King Saul. He and his men hid in the caves just above me here at En Gedi. It's the psalmist who said, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you, O oh God. You can understand the psalmist writing those words in this place. Where water is scarce, there is the Dead Sea, but it's not drinkable. It's the Salt Sea. But in these caverns, in these canyons, waterfalls flow. There is fresh water and the animals go to drink. Here, David and many others have found refuge down throughout biblical history. This is the land of God. Its name is Israel.
Eventually, all of Israel would fall to Babylon. The survivors are captive in a foreign land for 70 years. During this time, Daniel would be raised up and become a powerful prophet predicting the end times. Israel never again soared to the heights of national pride and influence reached under David and Solomon. In all this time, however, God was never short of a faithful remnant in Israel, much less prophets who spoke to the nation in his name. But then, one day, even the voices of the prophets fell silent. Israel, the land, and the people would struggle to exist. After this, the Bible remained silent for nearly 400 years. Until the strange appearance of a star in the sky, noticed by wise men from the East.